friends, Brian here for Yes You Can Play Guitar, and this is a big one for me, folks. Although we celebrate and talk about everything musical here, you guys know I am a fan of Bay Area Thrash, and to me, this is an absolute honor to have this man on. Uh, he was Captain Crunch before Crunch was cool. That's the best way I can put it. Please, it's an <laughs> honor here to have Mr. Rick Hummel, Hummel, formerly of Exodus, and now with the great band Die Humane. Rick, yep. it's an absolute honor. I, this really yes, means sir, a lot to right. me. And yes, we can play guitar. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when, when kids contact me for lessons, I, I got to tell you about the kids these days, Rick, like they have to audition to get lessons from me. No, number one, they got to be, oh, they got to be able to play the riffs to impact is eminent. They got to oh, be able to, yeah. Time, the song impact is imminent. Yeah. They have to be able to play the solo to practice what you preach note for note. And, um, uh, they have to be able to play at least one violent song, like maybe World in a World or something like that. Uh, wow. If they can't, I just tell them to get lost. See, that, that opening riff to uh, Impact is Imminent, is, that's, that's not an easy riff. Oh. <laughs> not that's easy at all. So, uh, so, Rick, you've got a new band, Die Humane. We're going to talk a lot later on about it. But uh, I yes, checked sir. out, yeah, I checked out your first single, Oblivion. I, I really liked it, and it takes a lot for me to pay compliments uh right. i really yeah so what are your thoughts on that song oblivion when you guys uh, were recording it um well honestly uh the whole the whole the whole uh most of this music on this album was written before i joined the band um so but when i was uh okay for for instance so when i was um sent the music at at the very first you know uh it was, uh, I, I fell in love with the music, but for me to actually play solos over the music was a lot different. And I had to really adapt and um, really, uh, really take a deep breath and just less is more, you know, with this band, you know what I mean? It's like, there's so much space and so much empty space. Um, it's not like, as you know, Exodus is on 10 all the time. Yeah. And, uh, the rhythms behind the solos in Exodus are extremely fast and brutal. Um, not to say that it's not musical, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't leave a whole bunch of room to be real melodic um, unless you do slow down like uh, uh, and just uh, not follow the riff, but more, more, more so than a melody line that's in contained in the whole song, you yeah. can maybe, that's how I looked at soloing in Exodus. And I would take, I would take like the chorus and the melody. If there was a melody in the whole song, I would incorporate that, try to incorporate that in my solo. So it would be like, um, I don't know, how would I put uh, So it, I like to think of my solos as a song inside of a song. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, no, exactly. So uh, that's not easy to do in an Exodus song. Um, it takes it takes some work, and uh, basically you just have to relax and slow down, and um, and just close your eyes and play, play, just play. Whatever happens, happens, you know. Yeah. And if it's a keeper, it's a keeper. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a big difference for me recording the solos on this album for sure. Um. I loved your tone, man. It, to me, yeah. I heard it right away. I'm like, yeah, that's Rick. I can tell by his tone and his playing. Thanks, bro. Yeah. Um, so, I the, yeah, I know, man. Rick, this this is, I've done some pretty big interviews here on the channel. This is a very big one for me. You know, I can't yeah. tell you how many times my mom kicked me out of the house because I had Exodus cranked, uh, <laughs> you know, where I'd be working out and I'd just be like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, have impact is imminent or fabulous disaster. I still, I still have it on my playlist. And I get, I get so worked up when I'm lifting, like I'm going to be 50 this year. And I'm like, I can't, when I'm done at the gym, I got to listen to Gordon Lightfoot to come down for the rest of the day. Right, right, <laughs> right. So you can go to sleep, huh? Yeah. So I'm going to go through a couple of quick of the, a uh, couple of quick standard questions with you. Uh, I think Eddie Van Halen was your biggest uh, influence, right? Yeah. Yeah. For, um, I've got a bunch, but in the beginning, he's, he's, he's pretty much the reason I picked up a guitar for sure. Yeah. Him and Eddie was young and, and uh and uh tony iomi you know what i mean like the old classic 
you know, the, the, the originators of rock and heavy metal guitar, right? Yeah. Um, I noticed Gary has always referenced Prince a lot. And in my channel, I didn't know a lot about Prince in the 80s. I was a metalhead and I just thought he was a... But the past year or so, I've done a deep dive on some Prince stuff. And we've in, we've uh, interviewed some big people in Prince's history. Um, yeah. He, he was amazing. So did were you already aware of Prince or did Gary kind of get you into Prince at all? Well, I, I have to ask. I got him into Prince, but... Um... I was born and raised in Oakland, and I grew up to, like, R&B and funk and rhythm and blues. Um, this is way before I ever even knew what heavy metal was, you know what I mean? That's just the stuff that I grew up on. Uh, so Prince is, like, he's, like, a huge, huge, he's our idol, really. I mean, you, you did see, so you said you did a deep dive. Oh, you yeah. Know how, you know how badass he is, bro. Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, no one could touch Prince. I mean, not even Michael Jackson. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, um, just every instrument on the stage, you know what I mean? Then he picks up a guitar as he just rips on a guitar and he dances. He's insane, dude. The guy's amazing. Yeah. Did you, um, did you remember when you kind of introduced uh, Gary to Prince? Oh, uh, that was early. That was early on, like uh, probably. I don't know, dude. Um, probably you know when I first joined the band. Um, I think maybe uh, probably eighty seven, eighty eight, maybe. Okay. You know what cool. I mean, you know, when 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 his first albums came out, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Um. Yeah, he's a bit, he's got some purple guitars and he's very, you know, like I had no uh, he, clue. Yeah. You know. We saw Prince uh me and Gary saw Prince live at the old Waldorf Theater in San Francisco, uh, the revolution's very last show. And it was insane. So this is how Prince used to come to the Bay Area. He books a show at the at the Oakland Coliseum, right? Plays that show. And then hops in a limo, and his crew has already got all his gear set up at the Warfield, and he he always did an unannounced show at the Warfield Theater in, in San Francisco. Just out of this world, bro. I mean, and if you ever met Prince, he's only five, like five two. He's yeah. just a tiny, tiny little dude. Um, but he wears these big ass stiletto heels, and he's jumping off of pianos and playing double bass drums and oh my god it was just, just it was i'll never forget as long as i live for sure yeah that was that was a, a big wake up for me it was, you know and i you know of course the the prince fans they've been wonderful to me and my channel as well and then i'm kind of i i did a reaction video a while ago to uh the exodus wall of death when rob was in the band and I said, Guys, be yeah i just like just you got you got to just so anyway it's, it's good getting people into different kind of stuff too as well but um Oh, yeah, your, yeah. So, wreck your first guitar. My first guitar was um, my very, 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 very first electric guitar was a Univox Strat. Um, I don't know what year it was. White maple maple neck. Um, and my mom got me that guitar. And it was a it was a cool guitar. It was it had no no Floyd. It was just uh I think this might have been before Floyd Rose. I don't know. Um, but it was a cool guitar. It I didn't have it for long because I traded it and a piano that I had for a Gibson SG about a year, probably about six months later when I knew I was like, you know, my mom bought me the guitar and I'm like, yeah, I don't know because I, I played piano before I played guitar and um. I was like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to last, you know, and uh, I started getting into it. All my friends, and all of us were getting into it. Um, and I'm like, yep, this is what I want to do. So cool, man. What's uh, Rick Hunold's first chord on the guitar was? <laughs> uh I'm going to say it was an E chord, but it was, uh, let's see, uh, it was ACDC. Okay. ACDC. Uh, probably uh, 
I don't know what song, bro. I, I can't, re <laughs> can't even remember what, but I know for a fact it was ACDC. And uh, Joe Satrioni taught me um, my very first, like, full song that I ever learned from, from Joe was uh, All the Young Dudes by Mata Hoople. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a trip. Um, so I started taking lessons from Joe. I didn't even know how to play a bar chord, you know. So, uh, because all my, because I'm from Berkeley, Berkeley, Oakland, and uh, all of my friends that were, that went to Berkeley schools and we were grow, grew up in Berkeley together, uh, all were, a lot of them were taking lessons from Joe. Yeah. They're like, dude, if you want to play guitar, you got to take lessons from Joe Saturoni. And I'm like, who's that? You know? And back then he played in a band, a power trio called the Squares. Squares, yeah. They were insane, dude. They, Joe was just badass. He's just a badass. Yeah. But um, and I'm just so proud of Joe. He's gone. He's got. He's gone so far. You know what I mean? Because I gotta be honest. You know, being a solo guitar player is a lot more difficult than being in a metal band. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like it's like tennis. You know, it's like an individual sport. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but, um... uh, he, he surrounded himself. He's not only is he a phenomenal player, but he surrounded himself with the right people, you know? Yeah, you know, and, you know, again, I want to keep things moving in a direction because I could ask you a million questions for, like, a week. But Of course. It, Rick, you, in a couple of recent previous interviews, one with uh, uh, Chuck Shute and uh, I think, uh, was it Marco was the other one? Shout out to those guys. Uh, you actually gave out a very, very valuable piece of advice to musicians, and I think a lot of people might hear and go, like, okay, so... But you said something very important. You said it's very important that you can get along with the people. And until you've been in a working band, I don't think oh. people can really understand and appreciate that. Brian, I've been doing this for 40 years, bro. Yeah. And it's the most, in a band setting, it is the absolute most important ingredient in the whole, in the whole thing. Yeah. Is if you don't get along with your bandmates, bro, if there's no respect or there's all these egos conflicting, because it's like being married to five guys. It is, you know? yeah. It is. Uh, and, you know, people, musicians are kind of, I mean, it's an ego driven. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I'll admit it. It is. It is. You know what I mean? Um, but you just have to learn how to get along with people, bro. It's so yeah. important. I mean, without it, there's not going to be any chemistry. Uh, then the band's going to last about two seconds. No, I mean, everybody, no. Everybody's wasting their time. You know, and um, I mean, one of the things I talk about on the channel is like, I've worked in different professional bands. I've been a hired gun. I've, I've had my own bands. You're a great guitar player, Brian. What's that? By the way, you're, a, you're a great guitar player, Brian. Oh, dude, <laughs> that got me off guard. Oh, you're too kind, Rick. I can't tell you how much that means. Um, oh, so um, I heard it with my own ears, bro. Oh, man. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. but uh, <laughs> So, you know, like a lot of people, but when you said that, I thought, you know, that's brilliant. Having been through that, I've got a very type A personality. I'm a Leo. Like if people weren't holding their agreements and stuff, I didn't have the patience for it. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of bad experiences, but I had some really good experiences too. But you'd also said to Chuck, you'd said, well, a lot of these guitar players out there now, they, uh, they just play on Instagram or YouTube, but then you said, but maybe they don't even want to be in a band. And I'm like, yeah, Rick, that's me. <laughs> YouTube, yeah. it's all on me. I don't have to rely on other guys. Right. Well, look, okay. So along, along with, uh, being in a band with, with a bunch of musicians, uh, that all have their own personalities and their own Id Id idiosyncrasies and their own faults. Everybody's got faults, you know what I mean? Um, along with all of that, then you have to deal with everybody being on the same page <laughs> creatively, creatively, and then with all everybody's got their own jobs. And dude, it's it's so hard. It's so yeah. hard. And um, like you said, you're a Leo, so. I was, um, in the beginning, you know, I wasn't, none, uh, it's hard because, I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of flakes in the music business, bro, you know, and, um, being in a successful band, 
one thing you learn pretty quick out the gate is you've got to, you got to be there on time and you got to put in the work, bro. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, uh, if you got to be at work at seven or eight o'clock in the morning and you don't get off till five and you go to rehearsal at six till 10, you're beat, you know, yeah. you're beat. And if you're late and people are waiting around on you and it just, the animosity grows little shit, all that little shit adds up. Dude, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and you know, so, some people might say to you, they might say, well, you know, Rick, like, you know, how many people can really in their first band play with Gary Holt and, and Tom Hunting? They might be like, there was a lot of magic happening in the Bay Area with a lot of those bands or those timing yeah, and everything. They were, they were just, they were just, and to this day, they still are. They're just dudes. They're yeah. just dudes. You know, they've, they've, through hard work, incredible, uh, incredible amounts of hard work, tenacity, uh, willing to stick with the game, give it bad or good, um, years and years and years and years and years of commitment and dedication and not being paid. Seriously, dude. Yeah. Um, they've earned that. You know what I'm saying? They've, he's he's earned that. He's Tom Hunting for a reason, bro. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he is, yeah. For a you know yeah. what I mean? True, and it's not, not you don't, that shit don't get handed to you, bro. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this too, Rick, and then we'll get back to the guitar stuff. But one thing about Exodus, from from like a fan and an outsider looking in, that Exodus could teach a lot of bands is like it's a brotherhood, and you guys love each other. You've had your ups and downs, but you're still. Where some bands, it's just brutal, you know. Like so, to me, when it's I see that in a band, that really impresses me. You know, when I saw it's you, ego, it's all ego. Yeah. Um, we learned a long, long. Well, not only, I mean, we naturally just love to hang out. We, I yeah. mean, if we weren't playing in a rehearsal room, we were hanging out at the club together. So it's like we were there. We were together all the time, yeah. all the time. Um, and uh. I'm going to give Paul credit for, for doing, for being a big part of that. Um, Paul was like, uh, Paul was like the Pied Piper of the metal scene, bro. Yeah. It's like back in the day he was, um, he, he, he said a lot of, he said a lot of, he's, he's an amazing, he's an amazing human being, bro. He's a legend in our scene at home. Um, and he, he, is either you hated Paul or you loved Paul. You know what I mean? But uh you had to respect his commitment to the to the to the music. Yeah. For sure. You know what I mean? Um like I said, everybody's got their faults, but but he was a he was a magical human being for real. And out of respect for Paul, I just want to tell everyone watching, uh today is February second, so there's a little bit of a cloud over us today because it is the anniversary of his passing. So this was yeah. not intentional, it just it just happened. So, but yeah, uh, that's all the irony, huh? Yeah, it's pretty. Um, but that's Rick, awesome. yeah. Um, first scale that you learned on the guitar, pentatonic. Yeah. To this day, my favorite scale in the whole world. Yeah, it's it's awesome, right? And then you, and then just... with, without it, it's it's nothing, dude. I mean, you know, you have to you have to. Um, and this is a, this is for a lot of the. I'll say this for the for this is my opinion, okay? This, um, you know, everybody's got their opinion, but I think that the pentatonic scale, there's so many varieties, so many variations, and so many ways you can skip. I mean, strings and 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 pick, and alternate picking, and this that that scale is so magical. And if you don't learn that scale at an early age. Um, I think that you, actually, if you learn that scale at an early age, you'll be ahead of the game. You know what I mean? Because if you listen to all great solos that are ever written, mm -hmm. it's based around the pentatonic scale. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. And it, it's all and it's all rooted around blues. So please, young guitar players, go out there and feel them blues, man. No, absolutely. You um, know? Listen to David Gilmore and, and, and Neil Sean and Michael Schenker. Some of the wizards, bro. Absolutely. Um, so 
Total honesty here, Rick. Did you ever show up to a lesson with Joe Satrani not prepared and not practiced? Oh, 100%. <laughs> How did that go? No. Not good at all. <laughs> he sent me home. He yeah. did? Yeah, not only that, but he made you feel like, what are you doing? You come in here and you haven't practiced one time all week. Why are you even here, bro? What are you doing? You're wasting my time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, hey, that's not exaggeration either. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, I, you know, listen, I mean, I, it was, he taught me a lot, a lot about, I think the, uh, I think that the biggest thing that Joe taught me was um, falling in love with the guitar. And uh, see, I had my, I wanted to do my own thing with the guitar. I, I, I couldn't tell you, I, I couldn't tell you what scale I'm playing for the life of me, bro. Uh, all I know is I know what a pentatonic scale, and I know major and minor scale, and I know some, but I don't know. I don't know modes, which, you know, um, or I don't know how, the, how they correlate with each other and all this stuff. I just learned guitar. I have hours and hours on the fretboard, bro. You know what I mean? So, and it's all I hear. If it's, it's my, my whole thing is if it sounds good, then it is good. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. matter how you get it, you know. Um, I never was a big arpeggio guy. I mean, I can't really sweep pick like, like, yeah. I can't really do that. I mean, I can like do it slow, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that. But I like to, I don't know. Um, you'll hear on the new album uh, what, I, what I'm what I'm about. <clears throat> I mean, I, if you listen to the solos that I did in Exodus, most of them were like, the tempo of the song would be like, like this, right? Yeah. And then I would, I would like, Try to like, dun, 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 da, 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 you know, stuff yeah. like that over it. You know what I mean? And that's a, that's been my style. I, I never, in, in less, except for Bond about Blood, I never really played fast guitar. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm pretty good friends with John Ricci, who was with Exciter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he, uh, I, you guys, maybe in 85 or something, you guys did some gigs together or something? Yeah, absolutely. 85. We did, actually, we, I think we did quite a bit number back in the that, that was the early early days yeah well he told me a funny story one time about you guys you guys like he, he the first time he saw you guys play i don't know if it was a sound check or at a show or something but you and gary and he went out and he told me he said oh my god i gotta play guitar after those two guys he was so blown away by both of your guitar playing that's funny because that's how that's how me and gary felt the first time we saw dime play <laughs> yeah so i uh, just so you know john says to say hi Hey, John, how you doing? Yeah. Um, so here's another kind of an oddball question for you, but in the Bay Area back at that time or when, when you were in Exodus, what was like the music store where everybody went to check out the guitars and the amps? Was there a particular store you guys would uh, would go to? Or? Oh, man, that's uh, – well, it, it, uh, places opened and places closed. I tell you, when I very first started playing guitar, um, there was a place in Oakland – called leo's and that's where basically everybody started out but then they went out of business um then there was eddie's music on telegraph in berkeley then there was uh subway guitars in berkeley fat dog famous um and then there was real guitars in san francisco eddie brow every eddie brower would do all our guitar work um uh and then Guitar Center, after everybody, and Real Guitars is still there, but I think all the mom and pop stores went out of business, and then everything was all Guitar Center. Okay. Um, so when you joined Exodus, when you first joined Exodus, can you just talk me through, as a musician, uh, about getting that crunch? What was it like? Like, you were looking for certain pedals or a certain head pedal combination? Uh, that's, or... that's, that's all... That I learned from straight up from Gary Holt. I learned that from Gary Holt. When I went to the first audition with Exodus, um, I brought a little tiny G, uh, G, G, Galen Kruger head, right? And one Marshall cabinet. That's how, That's all I had. So I show up at, 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 uh, at the rehearsal room in Gary's mom's garage, 
and uh, he's got Marshalls. I'd never played or heard her. You know, I'd heard them in concerts and stuff, but I'd never played one through one or heard one like in a room like that. Um, and uh, just blew me away, dude. I was just like, holy shit. Not only was he playing the music that I was just like having a hard time comprehending how fast he was. <laughs> it was like, because I was in a Judas Priest, Van Halen, Iron Maiden, Scorpions, ACDC, Sabbath. I wasn't into like uh, early punk and uh, there was no, well, back then there was no such thing as thrash. So, uh, you know, Gary was just playing extremely fast and I was like, God dang, this dude is out of his mind, right? And so, yeah. and so what he did is, uh, so after I committed to the band, I sold my truck for my first Marshall. Um, and uh, went out and bought a JCM 800 and um, a Boss SD1 overdrive, super overdrive. Yeah. And that's that's the secret to the crunch back then. Wow. Yep. No noise gate. So every time we had a stop in the song, oh. you had to be on your pedal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, man. So you guys must have been glad when you got your first noise gates. Yeah, dude, for sure. <laughs> For it's sure. kind of it's kind of like I don't know about the tuners uh, back then, but you know when now when they have a bypass on a lot of them, so it's not irritating the band and and everyone if right. it's going out of a PA when you're yeah. tuning. <laughs> so uh, I'm just trying to get the timeline right as a guitar player in my head. So you took lessons from Satriani, but then yeah. you were you were with Exodus not too long after that, right? Not too long at all. I played. Uh, I took lessons from Joe. And then I, I lasted about a year, bro, and then I just stayed in my bedroom for for a couple years solid. Didn't go anywhere, just played guitar. Uh ended up dropping out of school. Um and then I uh and then I auditioned for Exodus thinking when I'm like seventeen, maybe seventeen or eighteen. Uh and then uh got the gig. Thank God, you know. Um yeah, I was going to ask about that, too. There's a couple of interesting things I wanted to point out. Um, uh, when when Exodus got going, was your family supportive? Mine? Yeah. Uh, yeah, always. Um, I, I don't come from a, a, my, my, my grandma um, is the one that paid for my piano lessons. She's the one that got me into playing the piano. So I pretty much she's the one that pretty much got me into music. You know, I did, I really didn't like piano because they wanted me to read, learn how to read music and all this other stuff. And I was, just wasn't into it. I, I got pretty, I wanted to play by ear, you know, I just play the piano. Um, so, uh, yeah, but my, they were always supportive. You know, my dad was like, uh, look, you know, if, he was a contractor out of Berkeley. So if you want to, if you're, if you're not going to go to school, bro, then you're going to work right now, period. That's it. Uh, so I said, okay, dad, whatever. Um, and I, I just went to, I went to work for him. Okay. And, uh, and just after work, just played guitar forever. So what would one of those sessions be like in your room? Like, would you be just like doing exercise with a metronome or scales or riffs? Man, I would be, I'd be extremely loud playing ACDC Van Halen songs just it must have been the most annoying atrocious thing <laughs> yeah it I'm... was and also i lived in the ghetto so um the neighbors were probably like dude this guy's crazy yeah i'm just thinking though rick as a guitar player because you just took your lessons from sash but you must have got it together pretty quickly to play an exodus i i spent a lot of time learning how to play guitar but yeah uh, that's all i did i didn't do anything uh uh, I moved, my parents got divorced when I was 11 and I moved to Concord, California. Uh, and then, um, played a lot of baseball when I was younger. Um, but after I left my mom and went back with my dad, we moved to the, to the, to the flats in Oakland, uh, right on the cusp of the border of Berkeley and Oakland. And, um, I was the only white kid in the whole neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and we lived, um, yeah, it was crazy, bro. So, you know, 
I, I spent a lot of time just in my room uh, playing guitar, you know, yeah. and uh, I got I got the audition with Gary. And um, like I said, I wasn't used to the fast stuff. dude. It, it took me a little while to get I think the first song I think the first song that he played for me was Strike the Beast. And I was like, good Lord, have mercy. I mean, really, though, I was like, golly, can I even do this? You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I, I worked real hard at it, bro. I just, I worked extremely hard at it. Yeah. Um, so I was, was and always is a big Akira fan. So when I found out that your first gig with Ever. Exodus was opening yep. up for Loudness, for yeah. people who don't know, like Akira Takasaki from Loudness was like, Still, but at the time he was he was like a guitar god from Japan. He was he's there. He's the Eddie Van Halen of Japan, bud. Yeah, so he's the Eddie Van Halen of Japan for sure. <laughs> Your first gig with Exodus is opening up for Loudness. That blew me away. Yeah, sold out, and I was wow. scared, bro. I spent um, I spent the whole the whole night, our whole set, basically, with my back to the crowd. <laughs> and then, uh, okay, so that was my first year. Really, that's a, that's a, this is a funny story. Then. So we're about to go on stage, and I'm like, this place is sold out. Just a just many it was just crazy um and i'm just a nervous wreck so we get on stage and i and i, I that i tell you what that that hour right there that first hour on stage i learned so much from gary and paul that i've taken with me for four decades bro just how to deal with crowds. I mean, it was it was amazing to me to watch them. They just attacked the crowd. And I was like, whoa, dude, look at them go. Yeah. <laughs> and it was it was really an awesome thing. What was it like seeing Akira play live? Yeah, that was crazy. Cause um they didn't speak too much English, you know what I mean? We tried to communicate with them, but they didn't speak too much English, so it was kind of hard. Uh but we let him know that we, we, we love Akira so much. He was like, literally back then, he was like, he was up there with Warren D. Martini and George Lynch. And, oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah, sick. Him, he, was that, he was that kind of, he had that tone and the note choice and his vibrato was killer. Yeah. He used to play real well. He was sick, dude. Um, I got a kind of a funny question for you guys. I don't think you've been asked it before, but... Uh, when Paul uh, left the band, uh, it's well documented. You guys have talked about that. You asked Zetro to join, and he was the lead singer for Legacy, who became Testament. Yes, sir. Uh, did you guys feel bad at all that you took their singer? Um, weird question. I know. No, that's not a weird question. It's like uh, it was. I don't know, man. I. I really, I really don't know if there was that much animosity. It was kind of like a, a natural progression. Um, yeah. Because, not a, because Zetro sounded a lot like Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like him, you know, and uh, at the time we were we were bigger than Legacy. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, but we were all friends. I don't, I don't. Do we feel bad? <laughs> You know, it was kind of a uh, kind of weird at first, I guess. I guess yeah. you might say that, yeah. Um, but uh, but they got Chuck, you know what I mean? So yeah, and and Zet helped Chuck at the first few rehearsals or something. So yeah, yeah, of course, and Chuck, uh, we're all really good friends. Yeah. Um, so Chuck, I believe that Chuck came from Diamond. Um, a guitar player that used to take from Joe, who was like the absolute protege. Danny Joe's Gill. Cousin, Danny Gill, yes. Yeah. Danny Gill, beast of a guitar player. Yeah. He, him, and Alex and and Phil Kentner, they were like, they were like the guys in the Bay Area when I was growing up. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's uh, you know, I'm pr relatively well researched in this. Like, 
dude, growing up, you guys were our heroes. So like, you heard Phil Kinder, yeah. You know, yeah, Phil? Like, well, uh, if you guys were, you know, Laz we, Rocket, yeah, Laz Rocket for sure. And I think uh, the singer for Laz Rocket, he just lived on the same block that Alex did too in Berkeley. Michael Coons, yep, yep, they're Berkeley guys. We're all Berkeley guys. Yeah. So uh, they were from the hills, and I'm from the flats. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, back in those days for us, the fans, the, the musicians that were like, uh, you guys were our heroes, man. Like, like I was, I loved my parents. I had great parents, but I was like, you know what? Why couldn't you have lived in the Bay Area? You know, that always yeah. <laughs> bothered me. And, but it's like, uh, uh, but it's anything cool. we could get about you guys and everything in like the metal magazines or Canada had a, a, a metal show called uh, Power, Pepsi Power Hour much music and then it was the pepsi power 30 like we would like tape it and we were uh like it's just you guys just were the bomb for for us at least the people yeah, I hung out with. It's, uh, for me to think about that it's so crazy but honestly it, um i can't i can't even begin to tell you how special the scene was back then man it, it yeah. was like and it is to this day too it, it hasn't died at all it's there's a lot of new bands coming up that are just so incredible bro oh yeah. my god um, so but Ruthie's, I mean, Ruthie's was like, forget about it. Would you would you say Ruthie's was your favorite venue out of them all in the Bay Area back in the day? Favorite venue? Yeah. It was, it was, the it was, it had more to do with the evolution of our genre back in the day than any of the clubs in the Bay Area. But my favorite one was the Kabuki. Okay. Kabuki was huge, bro. This big old theater, and it had this big old stage with these wings that went out into the crowd. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we were all wireless. Oh, God, it was unbelievable. <laughs> well, that's cool, though, man. No, as I said, like, I can remember where I was when I bought this in 92. That's you and Gary. Is that, is that Guitar World? Yep. Yeah, I have a huge collection. But I remember I was actually at the mall I was in and near my high school in 1992. Uh, dude, I, I need a copy of that, bro. <laughs> hey, what what year is that? This is uh, 92, October 92. October 92, bro. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, Force of Habit just came out, and I was I was at a burger joint in the mall by my high school at lunch. Look at that. You're so <laughs> badass, dude. Hey, you know, honestly, I don't think there's ever been a thrash guitar player with such a big spread in guitar world since then. Yeah, and it's... Maybe I, except I, for Marty Friedman or someone like that. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, maybe Alex... Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I remember where I was like, dude, that was like, we devoured as much info and everything as we could on you guys. Cause it was like where we were in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, it, it just seemed like we were a million miles from the Bay area. Hey, let me see the cover of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Eric Clapton. No shit. Wow. That's, that's awesome. October of 92, huh? Crazy. Yeah. And this, then, uh, that's a that? big, that's a big article. Oh, dude, it was huge. And then here, and then it goes into, because you guys just released Force of Habit. Look at that picture. That's yeah. so badass. I mean, yeah. well, and then I think, uh, where did that go? Then it showed they had a really detailed thing on your guitars and your rigs, right? Yours, and then uh, Gary's Voyager, that was the name of that model. Yeah. I got to get a copy of that. Yeah. That's so, so, that's so cool. Yeah, like we would just devour whatever we could on you guys, any of the Bay Area bands, man. Um, so what did you guys notice? What did Zet bring to the table when Zet joined? What did you guys notice with Zet? I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Zet, and I, I'm going to tell you, uh, Rick, I love his channel. I love his show. I think he's amazing. He is one dude, too, that, I, you know, if I ever go to the Bay Area, as well as you, I'd love to sit down and have some chicken wings and just talk about the history. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, uh, what did you notice when he came into the band? Um. Well, I think he got the gig because um, he 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 was a little bit more musical than Paul. Yeah. But he didn't have the fire that Paul did. You know what I mean? Um, Paul was a special dude on stage, bro. And Paul lived his life. His whole life was heavy metal. Period. Bottom line. He didn't. He he didn't know anything else. Um, uh, I think Zet was a little bit more musical, to be honest. Um, he could actually sing, you know, a lot better than Paul. Um, and he kind of looked like Paul, and he was accessible, and he had experience 
and he was there. You know what I mean? We needed a singer. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like we listen. It wasn't like we went out to steal Legacy singer. It wasn't yeah. like that. At all. It just it was more of a natural thing. It just happened. I mean, I I don't know. Well, I what think it worked out. I think it worked out good. Like, could you imagine anyone other than Chuck Billy fronting Testament? Like, I had. I've never even really thought about it. And like, you know, I think it worked out well for everybody. It is a good fit, though, right? Absolutely. Oh, they're um, a great band. Um, Rick, what would you say? Uh, what, hey, just to put it out there, Alex is. He's like, uh, as far as thrash guys go, Alex is like, he's he's taking guitar to the next level. He's playing with some heavy, heavy, heavy hitters, dude. Yeah. You know, in his jazz world and his fusion stuff, Alex does a lot more than play thrash guitar. He is an amazing, amazing guitar player. Yeah, uh, I was actually talking to him a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully we can hook up this year. We're talking about it, but... Um, uh, now I noticed you said uh, in in your interview with Marco, there's a little bit of competition with Testament. Did you, if you don't want to talk yeah, about it, that's always, fine. There's always been a yes, always, but it's a healthy competition. It's yeah. always, you know, um, we've maintained we're 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 really good friends. I mean, I think we get we get better friends a lot with time. You know what I mean? There's a lot of yeah. respect that goes on. We're we're we love Testament. They're, you know, I mean, oh, look, yeah. uh, I never let's see. When in my when I was active in Exodus, um, we did a lot of shows, but we didn't do a lot of tours with Ex with Testament. But now they just tour all the time with Testament. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, um, you're going back out with them again. Yeah. No, absolutely. And even in this article, you you really paid Alex some big compliments. Like, when did you notice his playing? Just when did you really go? Holy jeez. <laughs> no, he's, he's, like he's he's one of Joe's proteges, but um. Um, well, I think, you know, Zetro's the one that found Alex. Uh, he's the one that got Alex into legacy. Right. So Zetro had a lot to do with molding Alex, um, to be a metal guitar player. Uh, I think if there wasn't, if, if, uh, I, I, I don't know for this for a fact, I did, this is just my opinion. I think if, if, uh, if Alex doesn't meet, um, Zetro and somehow doesn't find his way into legacy. I'm not even sure if he plays metal full time. You know what I mean? He's, he's, he's such a diverse, incredible. He's, he, he knows the fretboard in and out. He knows theory, like, like the back of his hand. And he's, yeah. he's, incredible. he's, he's, he's an amazing musician, but. Well, we're on that. Well, we're playing, on that top. He's playing with some heavyweights, dude. I yeah. mean, people that I grew up like, like big, like Stu, he's playing guitar with Stu Ham's band, and just he hangs he hangs out with some big big deal guys. Yeah, and uh, you know, and if we just go back to Satrani, he had quite the roster of students. When you look at everybody, including yourself, hundred um, percent. Yeah, like all these people went on to. Uh, uh, yeah, drink. I always wanted to ask Joe, um, how does that make him feel? You know, what I mean, it must make him feel pretty good. Uh, you know, because yeah. I can name, I can name five guys right off the top of my head that that are semi successful musicians. You know what I mean? That yeah. took lessons from them. No, absolutely for sure. Yeah. Um, so we might as well do the word association with the Bay Area bands, then, since we're kind of on that. So Testament. Uh, what what you word association? You want one Just, word? Yeah, or just like a, a couple of quick thoughts, and then I'll move on to the next person, uh, next band. Sorry. Um. Uh. Big. I don't know. This. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Death Angel. My favorite thrash band in the whole era. Uh, Forbidden. Uh. Groundbreakers. Along with us, they were there in the beginning. Violence. Sick. <laughs> and actually, I heard you were telling Chuck that uh, when Phil had to go do some work with Lamb of God, yeah, they were talking to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They reached out. Uh, they wanted me to go to Europe, and I was right in the middle of 
doing this whole thing with Die Humane and stuff, you know what I mean? And I just, I really didn't have the time to, to put into learning those songs, you know? Yeah. Because they're not real, it, it, it takes a lot, it takes a little bit of effort to learn those songs. Um, And I just didn't really have the time to give it what they needed. No. You know what I mean? But, but that's cool that you got asked, though. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Heathen. Uh, Savage. Machine Head. Um, um, in a in a group of their own, Rob Rob does his own thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, uh, I totally respect him for that. Possessed. Uh, oh geez. Yeah. Well, Larry is one of Joe's guys too. Yep. Absolutely. Hundred uh, percent. Non thrash. Laz Rocket. Brilliant. Vicious rumors. Underrated. I'm gonna say for Lost Rock, it's just so underrated, bro. Oh my god. Yeah, it's like just the wheels kind of, because you know from what I saw in the Bay Area, they were like really, really popular, and then when all the other bands started really getting going with their careers, they just kind of fell well, behind. Well, I don't know why that happened, but they had two of the most amazing guitar players in the whole scene. Yeah. Um, vicious rumors. Uh. Dude, been at it longer than anybody. Yeah. Um, sorry, Rick, my mind's all over the place. I got so many questions I want to ask you, but I'm trying to keep it all on point for you. Um, here's a, here's an interesting question for you uh, with you know the music industry. But what was the time with Exodus? Like, what would the time frame have been where it was just at the best point? You know, the bills were paid. You weren't stressed out about anything. Things were going really good. Like, when was the best? point in time with Exodus back in, in those days? That's a tough question, Bob. <laughs> I'm going to say... The time between Bonda by Blood and the end of the fabulous disaster cycle. Okay. So there was three albums there that that was just like epic. Everything about it. Because everything was so new and fresh. You know what I mean? There was there was times where, you know, the uh, albums didn't come out when they were supposed to, yada, yada, yada. But in a nutshell, looking back on it, um, the band dynamics, we were healthy. We all were just, I mean, not healthy as like we were, the, our dynamics as a, as a unit, Exodus as a whole, our relationship as human beings was just, we were on fire, bro. We were, yeah. we were, honestly, we, we were untouchable. I swear yeah. we were. Um, and then we signed a major deal with Capital, and uh, recorded Impact. As you know, in in my opinion, I think Impact guitar wise, some of the most insane shit we ever did as a band. Um, me and Chick, me and Gary. Uh, that album is just brutal, you know. Every everything about it—the solos, the rhythms, the the tone, um, the capture, you know, the guitar capture, the how it's just it's brutal. Um, but as humans, I think me and Gary were going through some shit um, that I've talked about in depth with many many times. But um, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm mean, the answer to the question is what to from the beginning of, of Bonded by Blood to the very end of the Fabulous Cycle, I think was the best. Um, I just want to point something out, my perspective on Fabulous Disaster. I love the album. Uh, uh, last Act of Defiance, I got a, a, a powerlifting friend of mine. He's, uh, I used to do some competing in that. See, look at that drive. Not near as much shaking, okay? Hips, adductors, abductors, glutes, much better condition. A little bit of shaking, but not like the way it was before, okay? Uh, he was a um, 
uh, a corrections officer at a big penitentiary uh, here in Canada where some of the worst in Canada are locked up. And we would train at his gym. He had a hardcore gym in his garage, and I'd always play Last Act of Defiance. That would be our, like, just a few years ago, that was our song to get us all fired up. He was involved in a big riot there and everything. And his, But uh, we would listen, you know, the prison system. Yeah. yeah. Inherently unjust. Yeah. You mean. Right? Yeah. Uh, that song. But uh, the words, the lyrics to Fabulous Disaster, you know, the music's fantastic. But sometimes really listening to the lyrics. I love the lyrics in that song because I don't know who came up with the lyrics or if it was a collaboration or Zed did, but it's, it's singing about living under the threat of nuclear war over your head. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, uh, did Zed write the lyrics to that or was that? Uh, I think it was probably a collaboration. He might have he might have wrote the chorus. I'm not really sure though. I forget. Yeah, I just, I just, it's one of those songs you listen to the lyrics and you're like, man, that's, that's brilliant, dude. I really, really like that. Cause so as a kid in the seventies and eighties, I can kind of relate to that a little bit. Yeah, we all can, but yeah, for sure. I think everybody, I think everybody in the whole world can. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. to move on to impact yeah. is, uh, to me, it, it's the, it's the quintessential heavy thrash album. Like to me, impact was super heavy. Man, it's just ridiculous. Some of that stuff. I mean, the guitar parts are. That's why none of that stuff gets played live because it's just so damn hard to play, bro. And I, I've learned some of the riffs. Brutal. It's not easy. No, it's brutal. Like changing of the guard within the walls of chaos isn't too hard, but there's a lot going on. You know what I mean? Um. But I think that was like playing wise. I think me and Gary were just on fire. Oh, the H team, brother. The H team. Yeah. Um, so Proud. I just want to talk a little bit about gear. Um, yes, sir. So for me in, in my professional career as a musician, I was always simple, like good amp, a couple of pedals, some good guitar, uh, good guitars and your fingers. Uh, yeah. Were you kind of, I was kind of a minimalist, but also, and like, you exactly know, the way I, that's exactly right now. Right now I'm playing through, um, a quad cortex, a Marshall all all tube 9200 power amp stereo, and a, a couple four by twelve cabs. That's it. Yeah, you know, it amazes me, and I mean this in a respectful way to these other YouTube channels, where all they do is talk about gear all the time, and I'm like, that's cool, but whoever watched that for three hours, you could have been practicing. But um, do these people understand? And I've played in front of different types of crowds. There's people drinking, there's people getting up on stage, there's beer spilling everywhere. So if you have a $1,500 foot controller and, or, or, or processing unit and somebody yeah. steps on it or falls on yeah. it and it's broken, what are you going to do? If you got some well, boss pedals there, just pull yeah, it out and exactly keep going. what I'm going through right now. So what, what I'm trying to do is the quad cortex is like, it, it's designed for the stage, right? You've seen one, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's it's steel and it's aluminum and it's all it's it's built like a brick shit out. But I really don't want to be stepping on that thing because it's my my tone. So right now I'm I'm I'm, I'm waiting on a MIDI controller, so I can have just the MIDI controller on stage and have the quad in the back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I don't want to be stepping on uh, the things are not cheap. No, absolutely. And then you need a backup and it gets into all that other stuff. But oh my god, back in the day, did, was there like a, an amp? say some pedals and the, a special guitar combination where, where you'd plug in at a soundtrack and go, yes. This well, that it. was always, always the JCM 800. JCM 800. Uh, yeah. With the, with the SD one super overdrive. Um, that was back in the day. And then we, then we switched over to triple X's. Um, and we did a PV endorsement for a while. And then now, uh, and then we went back to Marshall's. And now Gary's playing a Jubilee. Uh, now I got the Jubilee sound in my quad that sounds just as good. Wow. So some people, I happen to be a PV fan, not sponsored though. I uh, I like the 6505 series. I know. Sick Phil, head, dude. Yeah, Phil and those guys, they, they've had that's, some luck with it, that. That's, it's, it's, it's different than, like I said, like we didn't have noise gates back then. I mean, they were there, but we didn't use them. Uh, with the 6505 or the triple X and the, and the 5150, it's like straight through 
and then it's so quiet. You know what I mean? It's like brilliant. Yeah. And then with the little noise gate, it's so perfect, right? It's just crunch city. But, you... but I will say, when you have every freaking metal guitar player in the whole world playing a 5150, it kind of gets redundant, right? I mean, uh, yeah. I, a lot of your sound is in the fingers, but come on, let's let's be real. Um, it's it's become like the generic sound, bro. Yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, no. Did you uh, did you ever have? Do you have like a, a really bad gear nightmare stories where a head an amp head went or something well, happened on stage? Happen that happened to us all the time, all the time. Just because there was always so many people up on stage, and it was always so sweaty and. Just back in the day, we didn't have cases. And, you know, so it, it happened. That was almost like a nightly thing, really. Yeah, but didn't you, Gary, get some guys on that? Uh, uh, was it the Slay team or something? Said, Just tell them not to touch our pedals. Oh, yeah, absolutely. After that was my brother and Andy Anderson and Toby Ray, yep. Yeah. Um, so, Rick, I noticed for me as I'm aging, uh, there's certain things that are a little more challenging on, on the guitar. Like for me, it's if remembering... If it's kind of a complicated thing, I'm trying to remember it. There seems to be more work I have to put into memorizing. Do you notice anything as you're aging with playing the guitar? Uh, well, lately, that you mentioned it. I went out and got these, uh, see this right here? It's called Cherry Flex, right here. This is for cramping. Um, and this is also for uh, inflammation in the joints, because that's why you cramp, you know? So the thing is, is like, is to warm up slow, and warm up, you know what I mean? And then, because uh, if I don't warm up pretty good, I, I, I'll i start to cramp, you know what I mean? My hands will cramp, and then it's bad. Yeah. Uh, memory, uh, not so much, but um, I don't have to memorize as much as I did back in Exodus, because those songs are so crazy. Um, Die Humane's a lot, a lot, I'm not going to say simpler, but it's a lot different. You know what I mean? There's, there's not so much uh, uh, there's not as many changes and there's just not so many intricacies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, force of habit. I just want to touch on that and finish up about excess because I want to get tied to die humane. It's very important. Um, uh, force of habit. Uh, I, I know you've heard this a million times, but I, I really got blown away the first time I saw uh, Good Day to Die. Yeah. And you were playing, uh, I don't remember if it was a Dobro or a pedal steel or lap steel, but it was, I was just no, like... It was a K um, acoustic F holes that I set up for slide. No, no, was it? No, it was a lap steel. It was a lap steel. Yeah. Yeah, and the uh, and the solos, you know, one of the big things with Exodus was those those trade offs between you and Gary, and the so yeah. I love the solos and your solo in that song. It was just fantastic. But how long have you been messing around with the uh, the lap steel? I used to play quite a bit back in the day. I haven't I haven't played in a lot a long time. Um, I'm actually going to get start getting back into that. Uh, I want to get one that you can actually wear like a real guitar, you know, and play like this. Yeah. I've seen those out, and it was, those those really. Some of them, are, I just love the tone on those things, man. That that yeah. so warm and crazy. I, I got to tell you a funny thing, Rick. Just so you know, uh, I got I for years I I went broke playing a metal band, so I sold my soul, and I uh, eventually got a country rig and worked on my country chops and worked in country bands, and I actually made some money. But I played yeah. with pedal steel players and stuff. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. They're incredible. Um. So, Force of Habit comes out. I, you know, I think you and Zet touched on this on his show. But was there a moment when grunge was really coming in and things were changing where you guys kind of looked at each other and were like, "Oh shit!" Like, what are we gonna do? Like, you just I noticed think, things were changing, and it's like, "Oh, no, what's going I on?" Think, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people try, like, a lot of people bring that up, but it's it, Force of Habit was not. We never ever intentionally went out of our way to write those songs the way they are it's yeah. just it was a natural progression but it's just where we were at mentally and as a band um people would bring riffs to the table and we were like yeah that's cool let's do it uh like good day to die uh 
Thorn in My Side was a great song. There was some good music on that album. No, I love that album. I, yeah. I, honestly, uh, I like that album a lot. I just don't really necessarily dig the vocals too much. Um, nothing against Zetro. I think he could have. I think I think he could have done a lot better. Put it that way. Oh. Um, and also, you guys were. I think you guys were experimenting. You're at least tuned a whole step down, but I think you were using drop C tuning as well. So you had that no, really heavy exactly. sound. I was. I uh, was. A430 drop D. So it was a legit half step down. Okay. But it was quite heavy tones at the time. It was like, wow, like what are they doing here? I remember just yeah. going, wow. Okay. So cool. when, we, when we tune like that, we use extremely big strings to, so we keep that tautness in the strings, right? Um, so that's that's the secret to that that tone. Um, a lot of people just tune down and they don't, they don't, raise their strings you know you got to get used big so we use like 60s you know yeah because you can't you can't use thin strings as you tune down they got to take up the tension so you need thicker yeah strings. yeah because it turns into mud right sloppy noodles yeah no absolutely um let's talk about die humane a little bit before i let yes. you go uh so um you got sal on drums he played in typo negative he was in life and agony life and uh, agony pale horse Called Death, yep. Life of Agony, um, Chorus Typo Negative. He's a beast, bro. He's an insane drummer. He is the perfect drummer for this project. So, uh, and you've got Greg on keys. Greg, yep. And you got Josh on bass, but Josh is a multi instrumentalist, it appears. Yeah, we all are. We all are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Josh, Josh played all the rhythm guitars on this album um, and bass. And I think what's really important when you, with a band, too, is a front man, right? And I think with Garrett, with his voice, you got something very special there. Dude, Garrett, is, he's insane, dude. He's young. He, you know, he's a, he's a, he teaches English in high school. So, man, I mean, his vocals was the very first thing that stuck out to me when I heard this music. I was like, God dang, this, this kid is badass. Yeah. And not only can he sing like a bird, but his growls, you know, his metal stuff. Just wait till the next single, dude. You're gonna trip. Um, yeah. And while you're while we're on that, it's dropping on February 10th. February so, 10th. Del Shock. Yep. Yeah. So um, he's just an amazing singer, bro. It, it, oh, it, there's so many, so many dynamics. Is and he plays guitar too, and he knows he knows music. He he's just a natural, a natural. He was in a band called the Nova Skyway. Okay. Um, so if you want to check out Garrett's work, uh, go check out a Nova Skyway. Uh, I, so I did a reaction video to uh, Oblivion last week. I, I wanted to check that. it out. I appreciate. That's why I'm on here. I was like, <laughs> man, that's so cool, Brian. Thank you so much. I appreciate oh, it. Dude, of course. I, I want to say I can appreciate when things are, are different. You know, like 20 years ago, I was really wrapped up in the metal thing or over 20 yeah, years ago. Yeah, of course. We all were. But I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, these guys are smart. They're throwing different things at people. There's, it's like a, it's like an interesting story. There's twists and turns around every corner. Yeah, and it continues the whole album. Just wait till you hear the whole album. I'm yeah. telling you, man. It's, from the musical standpoint, for me, I'm so freaking proud of this album. But some of the best guitar playing I've ever played in my life. Um, it's not shred though, but it's just like. Some of the some of the material that's not even any distortion on any of the lead guitar play I'm playing, it's all like blues, like Gilmore shit. Um, uh, you'll see you, some of it you're not even gonna believe. You're gonna go, dude, this is Rick. Oh god. <laughs> you and know, it's... Rick, you said something really interesting earlier. Like, you know, I've studied and had to play different styles, but I am a shred guy. Like, you know, but. I, I don't like listening to guys that can really shred and they do it all the time. It drives me nuts. I actually, it puts me off. The analogy I use on my channel, it's very, it's, it's, you said, that's why I had a big smile on my face earlier. You said, my words were, a guitar solo should be a story within a story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, like, shred is great, but, you know, it's good to see music evolve and have different things. And, and, and it's still a wonderful thing to have technique and everything. But what I really liked, I like songs that can kind of, take you on a bit of a journey you know like I, you had mentioned you're a big pink floyd fan uh but I, I felt a little bit of that with the oblivion signal it's a uh, yeah. single because it's like 
okay, now they have horns. Now there's a piano. Now the dynamics have come down. Now oh, this heavy see. industrial thing. Yeah. So, and, and you know, um, so that solo in particular was like one of the first ones I laid down, I think. And that one was like, uh, I mean, there's so much space going on, you know what I mean? And it's actually really musical, uh, the, the stuff going on behind the solo. But yeah. it's just, you know, it's not that many notes. It's like, it's bare, it's bare minimum, you know what I mean? But I think uh, I like that solo. There's uh, other solos that I like better on the album. I think uh, a couple more, a couple more singles down the line, this song called Epitaph, is, you'll see. Yeah, I know. And uh, I'm hoping uh, too, Rick, down the road, uh, we're starting to wind it down now, but I'm hoping down the road you and I can revisit this again with uh, what's going on at that time. Uh, oh, anything. Yeah, no, I really appreciate your time. What's um, uh, fifth? So like, anytime around there, we can do another one. Yeah. Um, what can I ask if you guys are going to be playing live or talking about yeah, booking absolutely. dates? Or that's that's the goal. Yes, that's the goal. We want it all. We, we're going to put together a big show, like you know, like. Um, it's not going to be your average metal show. It's going to be more like uh, more product. Not not the productions like Ghost, but it's going to be like a big. It's we want. I envision big things. Like, yeah. With the with the with the uh, with the um, the the horns and the uh, and the violins and everything. You know what I mean? It, there's a lot of potential there. Um, you're with Ziggy Braun guitars now, or you, I know you have a new model. Ziggy Braun. Two new models, yeah. How do you find that? What's the scoop with that? Uh, how did I how did I get on that? Yeah, how did you hook up with them? Um, they approached me actually. Uh, a guy named Steve Bouchard. Um, I had been talking to him uh, online just because he's an Exodus fan, and um, he goes, "And by the way, uh, I had work." hand in hand with the owner of Siggy Brown guitars out of Germany. And uh, why don't you check out our guitars? And if you'd be interested to play them, we could work something out. And uh, the guy makes incredible guitars, bro. Yeah, no, for did sure. Did you see man. the blue one? I did. I'm actually, as we're speaking, there's one underneath us uh, that's going to be in the end when, uh, when we post this. Yeah, it's just some, I haven't touched it yet. I'm dying, dude. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to, he's going to send it within the next couple of days from Germany. So it's in a road case, but I'm kind of nervous about it. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you guys will be playing live. If you ever do come to like the Montreal, Ottawa area, please let me know. I'll come down myself. And, and I'd love to more than, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a live guitar player, but yeah, I, 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 wanna do. I miss I, it a lot. And you know, Rick, I told you this before too. Uh, I, I always loved your playing and um, I, I always felt you're really underrated. I just, you know, I just felt you just never kind of quite, you never kind of quite got the attention I felt you deserved. And it's just, I mean, it's not that I'm out, I'm, I'm not looking for that attention. It's just, I just, I do what I do, but I mean, um, who knows? I don't, I don't know. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the sentiment though, for sure. It's, um, it's just really nice to see you doing something and back at it, man. It just, <laughs> It's awesome. Yeah. It's dope. Uh, so, Rick, this is a big one for me. I was a huge Exodus fan, huge Bay Area Thrash fan. I really appreciate your time. And uh, definitely, everybody, check out Die Humane. Check out the single Oblivion. Their merch has just dropped. So go to wormgroup.com. I'm looking to see if they have a 3X for me. I'll get uh, one. I'll get one pronto for you, Brian. Uh, and uh, awesome, brother. And uh, uh, check it out. All the links, you're, you've seen them scrolling through this whole interview. But uh, check them out, and um, and Rick, it was an absolute honor, man. I really appreciate man, it. it an honor's all mine. It was my pleasure, Brian. I appreciate it so much. Remember, really folks. Do. Awesome, Rick. Really appreciate it. And we're going to talk again soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. So remember, guys, practice hard, but practice smart. No excuses. We'll see right. you soon. <laughs>